Your Excellencies, members of Ephemus Council, members of Ephemus, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, allow me to welcome you in the name of the International Institute for Middle East and Balkan Studies, Ephemus from Ljubljana, the organizer of today's lecture of Senator Mark Pacheco from Massachusetts with the title The United States National Elections and Electoral View from Massachusetts. A special welcome and gratitude goes to our ghost from United States, the acclimated and highly respected Senator Pacheco. We wish Senator Pacheco a pleasant stay in our wonderful country. Uh, Massachusetts Democrat Senator Mark Pacheco will talk about the United States election race. In his lecture, he will discuss the election campaign led by the Republicans, especially their front runner Mitt Romney, former governor of uh, Massachusetts. He will present the electoral map electoral figures and the projections based on the presidential election campaign so far and comment on the prospect for President Barack Obama, talking into account that the Democrats' election campaign is not its full swing yet. Uh, Senator Pacheco will also discuss some uh, other important issue relations to the United States election. Senator Pacheco is visiting Slovenia for the second time. He has many friends in Slovenia, among others also Mr. Ban Požar. Uh, the lecture will be given in English. It will be followed by a discussion with Senator Pacheco, moderated by my colleague uh, Bakhtiar Aljaf and myself, uh, Ziad Bečirović. And now I give the floor uh, to Senator uh, Pacheco. Great, thank you very much. You can hear or mm -hmm. I can take the Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, and let me just begin by thanking both of the uh, directors of the Institute for the tremendous hospitality and uh, for inviting me to, uh, uh, to join you today and uh, to give you uh, a little perspective from a uh, state senator in uh, the state of Massachusetts, as you've heard the title of the lecture is that of uh, the U.S. Uh, national elections, uh, a electoral view from, uh, from Massachusetts. Uh, I have uh, had the opportunity to work with uh, a number of the political leaders, uh, you know, in my role as a political leader in Massachusetts myself, and I will draw on those experiences to give you a, not a theoretical, but more of a real world uh, viewpoint uh, from Massachusetts. Just before I begin, I, I do want to recognize as well, <coughs> Boyan uh, Oza and his wife Barbara and uh, Barbara's daughter Teresa. I, 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 they just provided me such wonderful Slovenian hospitality here, I, I just wanted to make sure I, I recognized them. Uh, let me begin by, by saying that as uh, this is not yeah, because I don't really want the bottom part to go. Uh, 
That's good. I thought I had it all set, but I was I was mistaken. Um, let me. Um, First of all, I say, who, who, who am I? That's a question I ask myself quite often. Uh, and it's a question my constituents ask uh, about me all the time as well, as an elected leader. I am a Massachusetts State Senator. I have served now, this is my 24th year in the Massachusetts Legislature. I served for four years in the House of Representatives before going to the Senate in 1993. Our elections are two-year terms, so every two years since 1989 I have been running for re-election uh, to the Massachusetts Legislature. <clears throat> and before that I actually was a member of the uh, an elected board for 10 years, uh, which was uh, we call a school committee, a school board, which is an elected board, in, uh, in Massachusetts, working on education policy. Over the years, I have served uh, in a number of capacities in the legislature, chairing uh, Massachusetts Health Care uh, Committee. I presently chair the Senate Committee on Global Warming and Climate Change. I am the Senate Chair of the Environment, Natural Resources, and Agriculture Committee in our state and continue to do a lot of work in, in higher education and K through 12 education as well for, for being from Massachusetts that is a significant part of our positive outcomes in terms of our economy. In this uh, slide that is up here, you can see in the distance behind me, uh, well you can just about make it out maybe because of the, the lights, but President Clinton, and we can we lower the lights just a little bit. <clears throat> President Clinton is speaking in Taunton, Massachusetts, my home, my home uh, city, and sitting behind him is Congressman Frank, who is the chair of the Financial Services Committee in America. And during this period of time, Congressman Frank actually was the uh, in the majority party. And since then, uh, Congressman Frank was successful in his reelection, but the uh, the balance of power shifted. So he is no longer uh, the leader that's in the majority uh, party. Uh, but this was taken at uh, in uh, the city of Taunton where I live. This next photo is a photo of Air Force One. And in the photo, you may recognize over here to my far left, a friend of, uh, a member of uh, parliament here, uh, Ted, Kennedy. Ted Kennedy. And he, along with uh, Senator Kerry over here to uh, my right. And in the back, uh, on the left hand side, is Congressman James McGovern from, uh, from Massachusetts. There is an, uh, an aide to the president there. And of course, I was a little bit younger back in that picture, but I was, uh, I was sitting there. And the reason why I wanted to start off with this uh, photograph is to talk a little bit about the perspective uh, from Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, we sort of live, eat, and sleep politics around the clock. We are a heavily democratic state, although <clears throat> we have had governors. As a matter of fact, our last governor, a Republican governor, was Mitt Romney. Right? So uh, we have uh, dealt with many, many issues in our political system. I first was involved with President Clinton's campaign 
back in 1991 when I first met him with a moderate organization in the Democratic Party called the Democratic Leadership Council. The Democratic Leadership Council is a group of Democrats that formed a uh, pragmatic piece of, uh, of policy. In other words, we weren't, uh, our, our uh, feeling was we did not want to be uh, to the left just to be to the left. We wanted to embrace policies that would actually work as well. And so we rejected uh, a lot of the traditional uh, politics of the right and the far left, and we embraced a path to the White House, which largely is, uh, is delivered with the moderate base of America. Uh, the primary elections, as you, I'm sure, all know, uh, will uh, elect individuals who are popular within their party. But the overwhelming majority of Americans uh, that will be voting in the next presidential election, and the same was true here in this uh, election, <coughs> for Bill Clinton are not members of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Uh, if you remember back in 1992, that election year, there was a gentleman on the ballot by the name of Ross Perot. And Ross Perot happened to pull enough votes away in some of the critical estates where uh, we ended up with, um, you know, President Clinton winning, but not with an overwhelming vote. He won with a majority of the of the vote, you know, cast, but it wasn't a super majority of the uh, of the vote. Thank you. Uh, I have had the opportunity to work with all of the people that we I just referenced in the previous slide for a number of years, and I still uh, am in conversation with. Uh, President Clinton's uh, staff, uh, you know, often. As a matter of fact, I, I had the opportunity this past week to speak with your chairman, uh, Craig Smith, about uh, being here in uh, Slovenia to uh, come to this particular institute. And uh, he, was, uh, he was very pleased that uh, I was able to do so. Mitt Romney, as a leader, is an individual that I have worked with for a number of years. He came into office as a uh, Republican governor that um, was uh, very much uh, <clears throat> anti-immigration, <clears throat> uh, very much opposed to bilingual education, and those policies in a way, helped get him elected because he used in his campaign for governor um, what I what I found were, I think, uh, you know, divisive issues in a society. But it was uh, it was good politics for him as a Republican trying to win the nomination on the Republican side, and uh, he governed in a much different way because uh, Mitt Romney was uh, governor <clears throat> and he was uh, working with those of us in the legislature, uh, overwhelmingly Democratic uh, House and Senate. Uh, to give you uh, an example of how lopsided <coughs> it was and still is, uh, in the Massachusetts Senate, there are 40 members of the Senate and today there are five members of the Republican Party. Uh, all the rest of the senators are Democratic. And in the House of Representatives there are 160 members of the House and I believe it's just a, a little bit more than 30 members are Republicans. So uh, it's, a, it's an overwhelmingly Democratic state uh, but 
the citizens of Massachusetts have very often from time to time chosen a Republican governor to try to balance the check and balance between uh, the parties. And if there's a Republican governor, it's very easy for the, for the Democratic legislature to keep that Republican governor in check when there are the type of programs that are being impacted as we had to do from time to time with Mitt Romney. Now, I get this question a lot about Mitt Romney. A lot of people want to know a lot about Mitt Romney now that he's on the national and international stage. And I must tell you that uh, as a governor, uh, I believe that from the very first time that he was running for governor, he was really running for president. Uh, and he has been doing so uh, for the last eight years. He was the front runner up until this week. If you look at most of the national polls <coughs> that are out there in the Republican Party now, you will see that the Republican um, former U.S. Senator Rick Santorum is now moving ahead of Mitt Romney in all of the national polls. And if you're interested in uh, a polling site that I use quite uh, frequently, I go to a site from time to time called realclearpolitics.com. And uh, that site will have a whole range of polling information from Real Clear Politics to, uh, to Rasmussen, and there's a, there's a uh, uh, Reuters, uh, Reuters and, and, and there's a whole there's a whole range of polling data and right now Rick Santorum is starting to edge out Mitt Romney when you see this take place in the national media in the, in the international media CNN and BBC and others <coughs> excuse me I would urge you not to get too far ahead of what is actually taking place because I would not count Mitt Romney out of the race for governor yet. <clears throat> he is very well financed. He has been working uh, to be the President of the United States for a number of years. And he has a tremendous field organization throughout uh, the U.S. Uh, so he will still be a very formidable challenger as we, uh, as we move forward. In Massachusetts, <clears throat> outside of just the presidential election, which of course that's a big, big, big uh, race coming up in 2012, <clears throat> and as soon as we know the, Demo the Republican nominee, then the race will really go into high gear in earnest, because then you will see a lot more from the Obama administration. Right now they are working within the party and communicating with party members to give them the other side of the story when they hear uh, and see statements in the Republican uh, from the Republican debates, for example. Uh, but one part of our electoral system that will be crucial as we move forward is the United States Senate. Right now, we have a narrow uh, majority in the Massachusetts State Senate. <clears throat> that allows us uh, to stop bad things from happening from a democratic perspective. And it also allows us to pass certain pieces of legislation that uh, the House of Representatives would have to negotiate with the Obama administration about. Uh, Ted Kennedy, as you all know, as a matter of fact, it was the last time I visited uh, this region. I was here for a few days and then went down to uh, Dubrovnik in Croatia for a few days vacation and that's when Ted Kennedy had passed away. And as a result of Ted Kennedy uh, passing away it left a void in an opening in the Massachusetts, in the, in the United States Senate and there was a special election that was held <coughs> and the person that won that special election was U.S. Senator Scott Brown, also an individual I served with in the Massachusetts State Senate. I can tell you 
that the most surprised inv individual the night of the election uh, was uh, Scott Brown. Uh, that he was successful in beating, at the time, uh, United, uh, the uh, Attorney General of the Commonwealth, Martha Coakley, who ran for that seat. So now we have Scott Brown as an incumbent, but his Senate seat is up for re-election. And there is a uh, professor and a very articulate woman by the name of Elizabeth Warren that is running for that seat. <coughs> and we have fielded very good candidates across the nation to run against Republican incumbents that are up this year to try to hold on to the slim majority that we have in the United States Senate. Elizabeth Warren was the architect of the financial service rehaul uh, for the, um, the overhaul, rather, for the um, financial services and consumer protections uh, within the, the banking industries in, in Massachusetts. So she is, uh, uh, you know, a lot of what uh, she has done people have not seen yet because it is just being implemented. It is putting more controls in place so we don't have some of the problems that both Massachusetts, the United States, and unfortunately countries across the world that had um, invested in some of the bad paper, uh, you know, that they don't have those problems in the future. And she <coughs> was, uh, was very good on these issues. She is a center left. Uh, candidate, and Scott Brown has uh, tried to portray himself as a center-right uh, candidate. He has voted with the Democrats from time to time, because Massachusetts is, as I, I said earlier, a heavy uh, Democratic uh, state. Next, <clears throat> many of you will remember Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy was the Attorney General of the, of, uh, of the United States of America. And uh, you, you can see a little bit of the resemblance, can't you, uh, between these two uh, uh, photos, especially the curl in the hair. Uh, but uh, the grandson of Robert Kennedy is running for United States Congress to replace Bonnie Frank. Bonnie Frank has decided to step down He's no longer running for Congress, and so there's an opening, and this is uh, in my district, in, the, uh, in my region of, of my state. Uh, you will see Joseph Kennedy III vie for uh, the United States Congress seat. So when you look at the 2012 elections, from the European perspective, I know it's mostly about the presidential election. But actually, when a president gets elected, then they have to govern. So they have to work with the Congress, or in the case of, uh, of you know, President Obama, uh, when the Congress has chosen not to work with him, you, you did not see a lot of the initiatives that were put forth implemented, and therefore, uh, you, you, you don't see the corresponding progress that would have been exciting uh, to get done. But I will, I will get back to that because I do think that there is a lot of progress that has been made. And in my last slide, <coughs> I will talk about the economy in America and how that will have a tremendous impact on the 2012 elections. First, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the, the, the process, and this might be old news to a lot of people here, but I thought it would be interesting just to go over it. We have a series of caucuses and primaries that are taking place now in the Republican primary. Caucuses very similar to what took place in Iowa, where people will come to a particular location, sometimes no bigger than this room here, and people in a section of Iowa will get together and if they're for 
Mitt Romney, they would go to this corner. If they were for Santorum, they'd head out in the back corner. If they're for Ron Paul, they'd be in this corner. If they were for, uh, you know, Mitt, uh, if they were for uh, Newt Gingrich, they'd go in the back corner, and they would decide who, you know, who would give the caucus delegate votes. And then sometimes they'd be a negotiation between the caucus. And so it's a, it, it's a very awkward system, and it's amazing to be part of it. And sometimes you'll start off with 20 people in the corner, and all of a sudden they all moved over to, uh, to Mitt Romney because the party chair in that area had convinced them to move to another uh, leader. <clears throat> and that's what happens with the caucuses. The primaries, on the other hand, are direct votes of people in the Republican Party that will choose to vote in a primary. And so the primaries are typically more representative of where the Republican uh, feeling happens to be in a primary. And it's the same thing is true when you're having a primary on the, uh, on the uh, Democratic side. And I think there is somebody running against the president on the Democratic side, but I don't even know who it is. Uh, so Obama will, will be the nominee of the Democratic uh, you know, primary. There's no question about that much, I am certain. <coughs> then we have, in the, uh, in the primary process, there are winner-take-all states versus proportional representation. And that is true in the general election as well, where there will be states in our electoral college system, which I will go over just briefly, that uh, will be one to take all states. In, in other words, all the delegates in the state of California, for example, there are 55 delegates. And whoever wins California in the general election, even if they only win by one vote, all 55 delegates go to that particular uh, candidate that wins California. Okay. Also, proportional representation, a state like Maine uh, uh, in the north, <coughs> right above Massachusetts, they have proportional representation for their electors. And they do it by congressional district. So, depending upon how the elect uh, the electors are voted on, they will get a proportion of the vote. So if it's 60-40, that's how it will, it will work out for those states. And finally, obviously, the, the primaries are dominated by the party loyalists. I'm sure it's the same everywhere around the world, that you will have uh, people in a particular party that work very, very hard for their party. Uh, and uh, I, I was told earlier, it's like a, a big family. You know, sometimes we have uh, a little discussion and- That's my copyright. Yes, that's your copyright. <laughs> I'm gonna give you credit for it. <clears throat> and, and what happens is uh, you have a little fight within the family. And then after the process is over with, then you go to work for the party nominee or sometimes you don't. Presidential primaries and caucuses are, uh, have a calendar from January through uh, June. As you can see, the striped states are those states that actually switched their uh, date. So for example, Massachusetts moved its date to uh, March 6th. So we will have our primary in Massachusetts on March 6th, which is known as Super Tuesday. That's when a lot of the big states will have their primary that day, and you will have a much better idea as to where the Republican primary will, uh, will stand. <coughs> and then after the primary process, they go to the convention. The Democrats and the Republicans will go to the convention. <coughs> we will have a Democratic uh, we will have a Democratic convention because it will give the opportunity for Barack Obama to give his message to the American people. Once we know what's happening in the Republican primary, 
and, and the Republicans will also have an opportunity. People like Ron Paul, even though he will not be the nominee of the Republican Party, he will have some opportunity in the Republican Party because he is collecting delegate votes, right, as he goes through the primary process. And he's going to end up at the Republican uh, convention with a number of Republican primary delegate votes that he can hand over to either Mitt Romney or Santorum depending upon how this uh, whole, whole thing plays out throughout the primary process. <clears throat> In the general election, we have what we call um, we have what we call the Electoral College. Yes. I was uh, in a, a, another picture of me many years ago, uh, getting sworn in as vice president of the 1996 Electoral College in Massachusetts. So I have been one of the people from a, pra uh, from a pragmatic perspective that actually voted for President Clinton. The votes that are cast in the general election are cast to make sure that uh, you're casting votes for electors. How many electors will vote for a president? And then we have the electors that assemble, and then they vote. And they're supposed to be bound by that vote, but it doesn't mean they have to. So they could vote for somebody else. And uh, I, I, don't, I can't think of a, a case where that's actually happened, but also the swing states. <clears throat> if we look across America now, you will see, and I'm not sure if anybody can see the bottom of the, of the, uh, of the map, but there are safe Republican seats of 105. We're looking at likely Republican seats of 65. We're talking about states now. Yeah. 65 delegates, 65 electoral votes. And then leaning Republican, there are 10 electoral votes that are leaning Republican, but it doesn't necessarily mean they will go Republican. And in the middle, there's 111 electoral college votes that are toss-up states. States like Ohio, states like uh, Florida, Colorado, etc. <coughs> then if we go over to the House of Representatives, Again, there's a uh, 242 to 194 edge Republicans versus uh, Democrats. And we will uh, see how that goes. And a lot of it has to do with the presidential election with the House of Representatives as well. This is an important slide uh, to give you an idea as to what is happening relative to the United States Senate. Uh, the Democratic incumbent are in the gray area. The Republican incumbent will be in what comes across here as orange. <coughs> and there are no Senate elections in a big part of our, our country right now. So, as you can see, there are more Democratic incumbents up for election, for, for re-election, than there are Republican incumbents that are up for re-election. So this has tremendous implications for, uh, in particular, a Democratic president. Because uh, someone like Barack Obama can win the presidency and yet have a Republican Senate and a Republican House. And it would be very difficult to get any major policy changes done. And I know that's why uh, there are so many people that are frustrated, uh, both in America and throughout Europe, about why haven't you been able to get, you know, you pick the issue, done. Well, you can't get those done unless you can develop a strategy to get the votes in the Congress to go along with the executive branch. That is a major problem and has been a major problem for President Obama since he took office. There were votes that were cast in the United States Congress that I would suggest were actually not in American interests, but they were cast to stop 
the Obama administration from being successful on uh, particular issues. And unfortunately, that's the type of politics that we're dealing with uh, today in America, and I suspect it may be uh, beyond uh, the U.S. borders as well in terms of the, the, the politics of, um, you know, character impacts and personal uh, impact on candidate to candidate, and it becomes very, very frustrating instead of having a, a real good debate over the major issues of our, of our day. <clears throat> so now I, I want to go over just briefly how the uh, American media plays into all of this and how it will play in over the, uh, the next, uh, next uh, several, several months. <clears throat> and I go back to the Kennedy-Nixon debate because I think it's very important, in particular for the, for the political leaders that are with us uh, today. It is interesting that when somebody heard the Kennedy-Nixon debate from a radio, the overwhelming majority poll surveyed believed that Nixon won the debate. But when they saw the debate on TV, the overwhelming majority believed that John F. Kennedy won the debate because of how he appeared, how he came across, Nixon was sweating, uh, he did not appear as sure of himself, but he was very articulate and he came across very good via the radio. Uh, that's what happens when there's templates that end up being formed of a candidate. For example, in the case of George Bush, with the new media outlets, I mean, George Bush, I mean, I'm talking about uh, Bob Dole here. Uh, Bob Dole uh, had a little problem. He was uh, an older candidate, he was 73. The older I get, I think that's, I think it's fairly young these days. But uh, he was, uh, he was uh, always attacked about his age. And don't you know it, at one of his events, he slipped and fell what you don't see here in the photograph is he got right back up and he was very spry and he didn't hurt himself and he was very good. But what people saw for days upon days and upon days was this photo in the press, in the 24 hour news cycle that we now have and he never could recover uh, from this. The same thing is true with uh, Michael Dukakis, uh, governor from Massachusetts that I also served with. He uh, ended up taking uh, a picture that if you know Michael Dukakis, you would, uh, you would probably have advised him not to take this picture. He was very much out of his element doing it, <coughs> and uh, somebody else might have been able to get away with it in the Democratic primary, but he uh, was not, uh, it was not good at all. It was not good for him. Same thing with uh, <coughs> uh, Senator McCain. He looks like an angry pirate here, right? He came across as an angry candidate running for president, and that's how he was defined in the, uh, in the press. And uh, in American politics, we do a lot with backdrops. Uh, this is Al Gore uh, during his election, and you can't see it from there, I don't think, but basically the messaging would be behind the uh, podium. So it would be sending a message to the American audience about whatever the issue of the day happens to be in a presidential you know, campaign. We're going into uh, the type of uh, the campaign. We're going to be dealing a lot with issues, <clears throat> and that's happening now in the Republican primary. Social issues like reproductive rights, um, you know, gay marriage. Let me stop here for a second. Gay marriage. If you look at the northeast part of the country, uh, the states in red have all passed gay marriage uh, laws in, in, in that part of the country. Most of the country has not even touched that issue. They're staying about as far away from it as you can uh, be politically. <coughs> and there are uh, parts of the state like California in, in Colorado that have what we call domestic partnership laws, which is not uh, a formal marriage, but uh, agreements uh, with uh, domestic partnership. 
the issue of the environment and what we're going to do with cap and trade, uh, how we will move forward in cutting back on greenhouse gas emissions, investments in renewable energy technologies. Uh, this part of the debate is a huge part of the debate. And uh, we in the Democratic Party would wish that we were able to move forward much more rapidly on these issues. We have moved forward in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, for example, uh, just within the last several years, <clears throat> we have created some 5,000 new companies, some 65,000 new private sector jobs in the clean energy economy in Massachusetts as a result of several pieces of legislation that we have passed. If we're able to do the same thing at the national level, we would see significant investment in job creation, uh, some of which did take place as a result of the national stimulus package that the Obama administration did get passed. The health care debate is becoming very, very, very uh, difficult for the president. Some would even say that even though uh, we have private markets in Massachusetts and in America, we have private insurance companies that actually manage these markets, it is not, uh, as some would say, a socialized system uh, totally run by the, governor, uh, the government. It is not that at all. But that's what the debate will all be about as we move forward into the general election. In my final slide for you, that it, no, at the back, the economy. <coughs> is the economy. And I must say that this is really at the heart of the 2012 election, how the economy will fare. If we look to my left, you will see that during George Bush, the George Bush years, the red line in the middle is the job loss lines. Job loss or job gains. When Obama took over as president, here's where we were, right here. And every month since then, we have been edging back, improving and improving and improving, and we, we've been seeing less job loss, we saw less unemployment coming back down. It's nearing, uh, getting close to 8% now in, in America. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than where it was uh, when uh, President Obama took over. I would suggest to you that the economy, in particular if Mitt Romney is the nominee, because Mitt Romney will try to appeal to the moderate voters in our society. He's a businessman uh, that came out of Bain Capital. <clears throat> he uh, was involved in a lot of hedge funds. So there will be the Occupy movement on the one side, talking about fairness in the American system, and then there's going to be the business side on the other side talking about the economy uh, and all businesses are not the same, as you, as you know, uh, depending upon, uh, you know, have Warren Buffett and, and Bill Gates that are in a much different corner than, than Mitt Romney on, on many of these issues. <coughs> but I would suggest that uh, Barack Obama has a significant list of accomplishments that have been put in place this being one of them. If you look at Detroit and uh, Michigan as an example, the auto industry in America was just about over. And he had to make a decision. And his decision was to invest in the auto industry. And today that auto industry is coming back stronger than ever before. They're investing in a lot of, um, you know, green energy technology cars. They're becoming extremely competitive with uh, any place in the world market. They've paid practically all their loans off, and they've created jobs. 
So it's kind of hard to argue against the decision he made in a state where the economy is disproportionately that of the auto industry. So we will see uh, these types of discussions over the next uh, several months. It's my prediction, I hate to make predictions, but because I am a Democrat and, and we do have the, the Democrat in the corner office right now, um, and because of the polling data that is out there, <clears throat> I do believe if the trend continues to follow the way we are following right now with the uh, economy, that Barack Obama will be reelected, even with Mitt Romney as the challenger. One of the things that Mitt Romney has is an Achilles heel uh, of, of the electoral process. <clears throat> and it happened to him when he ran against Ted Kennedy for U.S. Senate. Ted Kennedy unveiled uh, Romney's weak spot, and that is that his business is very much unlike the typical businessman or woman who builds a, builds a business from the ground up, tries to expand jobs, create new markets, etc. His business uh, experience has been really in moving in, buying companies, and dismantling them, laying people off, and selling pieces of the business out from under the workers, which in America right now is not a very popular move you know, politically. They don't want to see a leader come in who will, uh, you know, destroy the middle class any more than the, the giving them any more challenges than they, than they face at this point in time in our history. So I think if the economy continues in the same direction, Barack Obama will be a president uh, once again. But as you saw from the other slides, it could be a very different Congress. Right now, we have the benefit of at least having a majority in the United States Senate. <clears throat> if the Democrats lose that advantage, a way in which people have to sit down to negotiate, then we very could, very much could be in a situation uh, for the next couple of years when nothing much takes place and people will continue to be frustrated, not only in America, but in other places around the world. I hope that's not what the outcome will be, uh, but it's too early to say what's gonna happen in the United States Senate races. They're gonna be very competitive races. Uh, I do believe people like Elizabeth Warren has a good opportunity to take back that seat, especially with uh, a Kennedy on the ballot in a piece of the state. Uh, it, will, uh, it will revive some of those feelings about a principled uh, you know, Democratic uh, you know, party in, in the state of Massachusetts. So let me uh, conclude there and thank you very, very much for the opportunity to, uh, uh, to be with you today. And I hope you will have some questions for me. So, I will be glad to uh, try to answer any that you, you do have. Thank you very much for your uh, very short and I think it's very, very nucleus you have this about the elections in the United mm -hmm. States and I hope that our residents have some questions. Please, Mr. Well, Senator, first of all, thank you very much for a nice chat that we had before this. Uh, and uh, I'm very glad that we are sharing the same taste for good omelets in Boston. Yes. <laughs> but uh, I had the privilege to to be personally in a synagogue in uh, <coughs> Manchester, New Hampshire during primaries when uh, Bill Clinton and Hillary came there. Uh, but, uh, that was a very pragmatic approach how to, to make an image of a good couple. Even at that time, we were already talking about other things uh, as far as Clinton was concerned. But they were having a nice, hard dance in the middle of synagogue and so on. So, so it was probably <coughs> done by your body, which was taking pragmatic approach to, to the elections. But I'm just wondering now, uh, when I'm 
watching the campaign, especially on the Republican side, that they are avoiding economic issues more, and they are more concentrating and being <coughs> focused on uh, social questions um, uh, about gay marriages, about abortion, about everything, which is in a way still a dividing sort of uh, key in, uh, uh, in American society, uh, and they sometimes call it even that sort of prolongation of the civil war. Uh, and now I wonder if really democratic side is going to keep up economic issues, try to, to, to show uh, the, the positive signs of uh, economic policy of Barack Obama, uh, do you think it's going to be this kind of thing or democratic side will be more silent? No, I, I think uh, that you will see the democratic side speak primarily about economic issues because it will be important for the Democrats to remind the American people of the shape the country was in when President Obama took over the job as president. And to remind everybody that that's not a direction that we want to go back to. That the economic policies of the uh, Bush, uh, George W. Bush years were failed policies that left us with, you know, the uh, the significant job loss in in the in the crisis in our financial system. So we we'll, we have a lot of work to do from the Democratic side to get that message out. You're seeing more from the Republican side about values issues because during the primary they're getting a message out to their base. <coughs> It will be difficult, however, for, uh, I think, a Rick Santorum, who is uh, an extreme s a conservative on some of these issues, <clears throat> to be able to relate to the moderate mainstream American voter, uh, in particular uh, women in America, uh, that vote in a very high percentage in, in the general elections. Uh, young people in America that came to the polls in record numbers uh, the last time around for Barack Obama. Uh, minorities and uh, <clears throat> diversity within our, within our country. These types of uh, challenges will be altogether different in the general election. So you're right, you are seeing um, the Republican base take over the media right now. But they're also creating a record. Uh, there's many speeches that are going on. There are individuals that are criticizing each other in the Republican primary. And I'm sure that the Democrats are taking copies of these speeches uh, to make sure they have that information uh, to be uh, shared with the American people in the general election. But the economy will be the overriding issue, I believe, in this campaign, although the far-right conservatives, time and again, have voted against their own economic interests numerous times because of the social issues. So even, I, I can tell you from going, I, I'm one of the people that go door to door in New Hampshire. And when you go door to door in New Hampshire and you knock on somebody's door and you can see the house that they live in and you know from talking to them that they are from a middle class background, <clears throat> maybe even economically challenged to make ends meet in a family, and yet they will be talking to you about the Republican. And you know, almost always it's because of either the abortion issue or uh, the gay rights issues or, or, or some family value based issue that they take that position. And so it is going to, it is going to be uh, a, a challenge, but I think, again, the overwhelming majority of the mainstream voter uh, in the states 
you, you saw in a lot of the, the country, a lot of red. But in the center of the country, in the Midwest, <clears throat> in the South, in parts of the South, you do not have a lot of people. You know, in some of the states, there are more cows than people. Uh, and so they're very conservative uh, values in, in the Midwest, in, in some of the uh, parts of the United States. But in the East Coast states, West Coast states, it's, uh, it's very different. Uh, and, and in Florida, it, it has always been a swing state. It will be again. Florida, Ohio, uh, Iowa, Colorado. But the difference is because of the dynamics and diversity in America now, you may see a state like New Mexico that the Democrats could win. You may see a state like Arizona that the Democrats could win, a state that uh, John McCain is the senator in. So uh, the demographics have changed significantly. It's like migration from the east. Yes, and, and a lot of people are predicting with American politics that if you look at a couple of more election cycles, that it will be a, a preference democratic type of base that is changing in America in terms of the, uh, the demographics. Yes? Sandra, Sandra, thank you for your talk. I had the privilege in the past of visiting a beautiful state and enjoy the friendship of my academic colleagues at Harvard, MIT, and the Boston College. Uh, As an alumni from Penn State. Yes, right? Penn yeah. State. <laughs> Could you tell us more about Mitt Romney, about his personality? Could you compare him with Obama? Suppose they will be the main debaters at the end and after the conventions. How would this debate come out? in your own estimation? Well, it will sound like I'm going to give you a partisan answer, and I, I guess I will, but uh, let me say that Mitt Romney, in my opinion, um, is very different than Barack Obama. Uh, not only his, uh, his background, his uh, ability to relate to people in, in different classes in our society. Uh, when Mitt Romney was governor, you, you did not see Mitt Romney uh, stopping by as Ronald Reagan did, you know, many years ago, <coughs> as a Republican, a local pub to walk through unless it, every piece of it was choreographed. You know, Reagan would walk in. He felt at home with the average guy and gal. He could transcend that uh, where, where he was as a, as a president in, in, in somebody that was a, a labor leader, actually, within the... Uh, within the uh, American Film uh, Actors Guild. So, <clears throat> so I do think uh, there is a major difference there. And I think as the campaign goes on, people will begin to see that. The contrast between Obama and Romney and who's on your side for the average American voter. Who's going to be on your side fighting for you every day. And uh, I think Romney will come across as being on the side of the some of the some of the corporate interests that are, that are interested in taking American jobs away as opposed to uh, those interests that are that are that are involved in and want to create more of an economic opportunity for uh, for citizens in America. I think also even in foreign policy, and I, I don't know enough about uh, Mitt Romney's uh, foreign policy, but I can give you an example of something that will be a hint to where he may be in engagement in the world. 
He is not that I know of been someone that has really been engaged as a governor. When he came into office replacing a former Republican governor, we had Massachusetts trade offices in places all around the world. It was an investment, the legislature, Democratic legislature, and a Republican set of governors made to ensure that Massachusetts was represented in Taipei, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, in Hong Kong, in, uh, in, in Germany, in, in, in other locations in, in Europe, uh, in, in other places in, in the Pacific Rim. Uh, we had uh, local offices in all of these places when Mitt Romney was sworn in to take the oath of office. In his first year as, uh, as governor, uh, to cut back, even Bill Weld, who was a Republican governor, a fairly uh, uh, fiscal conservative, socially liberal, but fiscally conservative governor, <coughs> he was very big into, into uh, uh, trade. I can remember going to Taipei, Hong Kong, Taipei, in, in Vietnam, with then Lieutenant Governor uh, Paul Salucci, who became governor in Massachusetts. And I visited our trade office in Taipei. Several years later, I was invited by the um, Taipei Economic Council to come back to uh, Taiwan. And I went with a delegation from Massachusetts. And when I landed there, and this was during Mitt Romney's term as governor, I asked, I said, well, I would like to go see the Massachusetts office. And I sadly found out we didn't have them, that they were all shut down. Now, that is in contrast uh, significantly with a, a, a Barack Obama who selected Hillary Clinton to be his Secretary of State, and not only his Secretary of State, but, you know, <clears throat> with that selection, you sort of got two for the price of one because. You know, President Clinton has been an outstanding advocate and has moved forward in a couple of very tenuous situations uh, with some uh, uh, hostages, etc., uh, in trying to work along with Al Gore as well in some of these uh, issues with foreign policy. Very skilled leaders in, in uh, foreign policy. Hillary Clinton, I think, has done a fantastic job. Um, I think that just in that instance alone, I see markedly different philosophies. I see a philosophy from Romney that would be laissez-faire, stay out of the way of business, period. Uh, we don't have to get involved uh, with anything else around the world, you know, period. I, th I think that's where we will go, and if anything, we may see more of uh, uh, the George W. Bush uh, philosophy when it comes to that. Now, in some cases, uh, you know, I actually agreed with some of uh, some of uh, Bush's uh, scenarios uh, in some cases. But when you look at <coughs> where he was overall, we have a much more engaged, strategic alliance that is beginning to put be put in place. If you go on to the U.S. Department, State Department's website. You will see, and I think it has just come up the last uh, last couple of weeks, that there is a new energy and environmental undersecretary that is being put in place out of the State Department. Crucial in terms of uh, this region of the world. You know, uh, what happens with energy policy? What do we do with with states that depend upon energy from certain sectors uh, in other states that may not always be friendly, uh, you know, towards them. What is going to be our, you know, national policy <clears throat> regarding that and how can we work together? Uh, they're creating a, uh, a strategy 
for the old Silk uh, Highway. Looking at Afghanistan, you know, post uh, de deployment of the troops there, looking at the future, trying to work with other uh, states in that region with what is called by Secretary Clinton soft power and trying to look at uh, commercial diplomacy, improving commercial opportunities for uh, other uh, types of, uh, um, you know, businesses in, in various states in the world. <clears throat> so I, I see that as a, a tremendous opportunity for uh, President Obama, although the American people, unfortunately, uh, mostly, do not vote on foreign policy issues. I hate to disappoint <laughs> you might, my European audience here, but they uh, voting on, as Tip O'Neill would say, the former Speaker of the National House, would say all politics is local. So they need to have it articulated for them as to why it makes a difference to, uh, to have these uh, <coughs> these foreign policy uh, debates that we have, <clears throat> and it, it is certainly worthwhile having those debates, and I think Obama can make the case that what they're trying to do is less costly to the American people than the alternative. And so foreign investment, uh, working with the commercial sector, in trying to build uh, a better strategy is much more cost e efficient for the United States than uh, what we had gone through in, in, well, you can name the places around the world. What about Iran? Well, Iran is going to be a challenge, and, and uh, we'll, we'll see. And I, I still think that they are trying to work with uh, our allies to uh, come up with a diplomatic solution there. I spoke uh, the other evening actually with uh, a <coughs> former ambassador to uh, to Albania from uh, uh, from Kosovo who is now uh, appointed as the uh, person that's heading up the uh, the independent uh, analysis that's going on with the nuclear uh, nuclear treaties etc to have an independent look as to what's taking place in Iran. So, so we'll have to see what, what takes place there and what is actually going on and, and let that process uh, unfold. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Jan Bujan, uh, ambassador of uh, Kosovo, former uh, from, uh, Kosovo ambassador to Albania. Uh, and I'm uh, very privileged to be able to address you a couple of questions. First of all, I'd like to commend you and to express my appreciation uh, uh, for your presentation. Very elaborate, very interesting, and uh, I'm very inspired as well. And I would like to hook up the link to the foreign policy issue that you uh, referred to and uh, the gentleman touched uh, upon. Well, that is Iran. Uh, maybe I would uh, wonder how foreign policy issue would play out in the, in the electoral process, namely uh, the developments uh, and the crisis around that's brewing around Iran, for one thing, and uh, the other, uh, with Putin and the presidential election out there in Russia, and his statement uh, just today, basically, that uh, there will be a major, uh, major uh, beefing up of uh, Russian defense budget and arming as a, as a reference uh, or as a Russian response to the missile uh, missile defense that's being installed or was, uh, will be installed uh, in Europe and elsewhere. A major beef up uh, of the Russian defense uh, expenditures and budget. How would you think that would play out? And, in the electoral, uh, electoral process in the U.S., irrespective of who will be the candidates of, uh, of the Republican Party, and who will be the, will be the of course, uh, the Democrats will be present, present along the uh, question. The implication, even though I'm, I'm, I'm fully aware, as you uh, mentioned, that the foreign policy issues uh, do not really uh, affect so very much the international the electoral uh, in the 
US, but if they get polarized very much, as, as all the likelihood is, that the Iran issue could, and that the Russian new uh, uh, post electoral, post presidential elections uh, in Russia will likely be the new direction of defense swing of, of Russia. <coughs> How that would possibly help? Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, quite a question, Ambassador. I wish uh, I wish Secretary Clinton was here <laughs> to uh, to answer it uh, for me. <clears throat> I must say that it's not just uh, relationships with uh, with uh, I Iran. You know, Russia. We can look at a number of places around the world where there are challenges. You know, not the least of which is, uh, you know, North Korea. Uh, other, you know, other hotspots that we need to uh, try to, to the extent possible, work with our allies uh, to come up with a strategy that will <clears throat> be in the best interests of both uh, U.S. interests in. In uh, you know, in in the case of of Europe, Euro European interests as well. Uh, I don't have a specific answer right now. I think it will depend largely on reactions to what you know take place over the next uh, over the next uh, uh, several months. <coughs> I think that there may be political posturing going on in other jurisdictions outside of America for the purpose of the electoral process in other countries. Uh, so <coughs> I think during election season it's always dangerous to, to try to predict exactly what's going to happen in terms of uh, uh, you know world events when, it, when, you, when you're talking about deploying military or you know those types of things. So obviously, throughout our history in, in in America, we've always tried to have that be one of the last options. I know we have been criticized a little bit because of the action with uh, uh, moving forward in eliminating Osama bin Laden. That was an action, I think, that uh, uh, the president moved forward uh, with because of the <clears throat> act of war that, that came forth uh, to America on our own soil. And uh, there was a feeling that there was a need to respond and respond as quickly as possible. Obviously, under the, the, the Bush years, that, that did not happen. Uh, we were able to... <coughs> Uh, find him and 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 uh, uh, bring forth what many in America would say was 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 justice. Uh, having said that, I understand that there are you know complicated feelings out there around around these uh, around these issues. So I don't have a <clears throat> a crystal ball as to what's going to happen in Russia. I must tell you, I, I visit Russia every year. I've been to the west of Russia, uh, near uh, a place called uh, Skov, Russia. And when I talk to the average Russian citizens uh, in that region of the world, they are not interested in seeing uh, military <coughs> activities, you know, you know, taking place. Uh, as, uh, Russia is going through a tremendous transition right now as well, economically. Uh, they're fortunate that they have a lot of, you know, natural minerals and, and uh, uh, oil rights, etc., that that they can hopefully move forward with their their economy. Uh, and in many areas, Russia and the United States and China in the United States have been working very cooperatively together. So <clears throat> I would say that there are still uh, significant possibilities uh, to building on the already uh, 
positive relationships that that exist with many of these uh, these countries that you that you reference, and we want to give that uh, uh, engagement, that, uh, uh, that commercial diplomacy, a chance to uh, to work. Because when you empower <clears throat> the people, and they see uh, positive outcomes, then uh, I think we have a better chance for uh, real democracy, you know, as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah, I, just, I have just two simple questions. So I was following a little bit the um, beginning of the, the story with Romney and his first point is about, let's say, negative politics, he said that you know, he won that primary or that, I think it was about three weeks ago, he won that based on negative, negative campaigning against New for a week before the campaign. He won against expectations, let's say. Okay? So he's a classic negative politician campaigning guy. And there's an expectation he go very negative as his strategy, rather than saying, I'm going to do this, he's going to say, this guy is in favor of the office. And Obama's on the other side, a very much a people's champion, positive politician, where he actually goes. He's not such a negative campaigner, he's more about engagement. I think the classic one is he engages his opponent, uh, Mrs. Clinton, his cabinet. I mean, this is you know, unprecedented, uh, let's say, thinking, let's say, in that context. So, on the one side, you have a very positive politician, let's say, classically, on the other side, very negative one. So, and I think this would play out in the, in the election itself. Which think the, let's say, American people would be more sympathetic to in the current environment? You mentioned the political environment, this is my second question. You showed a very nice graph on the unemployment statistics, or the employment statistics changing, but they will all come back to this trillion year deficit story, because that's what they will have on, on the other side. Which argument is the American person going to understand easier, the, the debt issue or the employment issue in terms of the campaign, not in terms of the benefits of themselves, but in terms of how that message is going to go up. If one guy is going to go up with a positive message on employment, another guy is going to go up one trillion a year for four years, four trillion in debt, we have more than we started. You know, those two simple things, just to give you a view on it. You've uh, touched on a very, very important <clears throat> part, and I should have actually got into that a little bit in terms of the debt. But it's interesting, the debt is where we are with the debt because the policies that were put forth by the Bush administration have led us in that direction. In other words, the tax rates on the most wealthy in our society, in America, were actually lowered at a time when we got involved with, what, free wars. You know, there, there, there was never a time in our history when we were involved with uh, military action, when we did not ask the American people to help in terms of paying for uh, this investment. So <clears throat> I agree with you, it will be part of the campaign. And it will be part of the uh, campaign where Barack Obama gets to tell the story about how we got the debt that we have. Because when President Clinton left office, we had a surplus. Before all those red bars were taking place, we had a surplus. And President Obama will actually have a partner in telling that story. Because President Clinton, and you may be able to find it online, <clears throat> but he recently went out to one of the universities in, in the country and gave a speech on the economic policies of the Clinton-Gore administration and how jobs were created. Now, it's not exactly the same today as it was when they took over, but there are some unique similarities. Um, there is a huge feeling in America today that people are not being treated fairly economically. And that what ga that's what gave rise to the occupant, Occupy uh, movement in, in America, where they use the signs 99%, that we're part of the 99%, and the top 1% is not paying their fair share of taxes. That why should... Um, <clears throat> 
Why should Warren Buffett's secretary pay a higher percentage of her taxes than Warren Buffett pays? And I think that's the other side of the debt question. You know, how did we get to the debt in laying that out uh, for the American people? And also, where we could be. Um, I'll just give you an example using Massachusetts with energy. <clears throat> in the state of Massachusetts, we spend approximately $28 billion a year on our energy costs. 80% of that costs um, go to states outside the United States or to uh, states outside of Massachusetts. We're trying to move to a new future where we take that $22 billion, that 80%, and having it come back to Massachusetts, reinvesting it in our own energy supply systems with new automobile, uh, you know, electric, you know, vehicles, uh, wind, solar, trying to take all of that and invest it back in Massachusetts, <clears throat> thereby stimulating the economy. That's why we've created some 4,990-some-odd uh, companies and over 65,000 new jobs. The Obama administration will be making the case through the campaign that we are in a trans transition period in our economy. And yes, we do need some investment to fix America's infrastructure, uh, to invest and pay off some of the expenses we incurred with the wars that we have been involved with. We have to pay those bills. And how do you pay the bills? Fairly. We have some austerity programs that have gone into place. But when the tax rate is not even close to what it was under Clinton, and America did the best it's ever done under the Clinton tax uh, proposals. <clears throat> so I think um, it will be an issue in the campaign, the debt. And, but you won't have a singular viewpoint as you do during the Republican primary. Right now, when you go into the debates, you'll have Republican after Republican talk about the debt, and somehow it's all Obama's fault, and so on. There's nobody in the Republican primary that's showing the slide I showed you of the uh, jobs, right? In the general election, that will come forward. And in will be reaching out to the American people to explain that we need uh, fairness in the system. People are not necessarily, uh, you know, Republicans will talk about tax cuts and and uh, how they're against tax increases. What we want to talk about in this election, I think what President Obama will talk about, is tax fans. That we need to have a fair system in place for the American people, in particular the middle class uh, of, the, uh, of the voters in America. Are there any questions? No. Thank you very much, Mr. Senator. Now we have Ziad. I hope you enjoyed this lecture uh, and discussion as much as I did. Uh, I would like to thank Senator Pacheki uh, for his contribution to better uh, understanding of the election uh, situations or campaign in the United States. At the end, I would like to invite you all to the next, to, to, to the next lecture. Uh, our guest will be Mr. Stephen Mesic, Honor President of our Institute and former Croatian President. His lecture with the title, The Collapse of Yugoslavia, 20 years after, will be uh, held on 22 March uh, at uh, 3 o'clock p.m. Thank you very much. And finally, it's a gift uh, for, uh, for remember uh, our visit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.